This is StoryBeat, Storytellers on Storytelling, an exploration into how master storytellers and artists develop and build brilliant stories and works of art that people everywhere love and admire. So join us as we discover how talented creators of all kinds find success in the worlds of imagination and entertainment. Here now is your host, Steve Cuton. Thanks for joining us on StoryBeat. We're coming to you from the Center for Media Innovation on the campus of Point Park University in the heart of downtown Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. If you like this podcast, please take a moment to give us a rating or review on whatever app or platform you're listening to. Your support helps us bring more great StoryBeat episodes to you. My guest today, Barney Berman, is a third-generation monster maker. Barney was quite literally raised in and around the art of makeup effects. At 14, he started officially working with his father, Tom Berman, in his special makeup effects shop, the Berman Studios. By the time he turned 23, Barney was already designing and creating monsters and dead people for indie filmmakers like Roger Corman and others. Eventually, Barney would take on the role of key makeup effects artist for productions such as Body Snatchers, Star Kid, Powder, The Rage, Carrie 2, and The X-Files, to name but a few. He has since worked alongside some of the most prominent and talented artists in the film industry, directors such as Ben Stiller, Tim Burton, Ben Affleck, Ron Howard, Gore Verbinski, Brian Singer, Zack Snyder, Michael Bay, Jonathan Demme, Milos Forman, Leonard Nimoy, and many others. Since 2004, when he first opened his own makeup effects studio, B2FX, Barney has created makeups on many of the biggest makeup-heavy films in modern cinema, such as Pearl Harbor, How the Grinch Stole Christmas, Planet of the Apes, Men in Black 2, The Ring and The Ring 2, Pirates of the Caribbean, Mission Impossible 3, and Blades of Glory. In 2008, Barney was hired to co-design the memorable makeup for Tom Cruise in the summer blockbuster, Tropic Thunder. Barney also created and designed the spectacular special characters in the hit NBC TV show, Grimm. His artistic skills and personal aesthetic proved rewarding when, in 2010, Barney was honored with an Academy Award for his work in J.J. Abrams' reboot of Star Trek. Most recently, Barney found adventure traipsing around the country, turning Sasha Baron Cohen into six different characters for his latest and most scandalous project, Who is America? And through all of this, Barney, the cineast, has longed to play a bigger role as a filmmaker after having been an actor from the age of 11 and a writer for the past 25 years. Barney's feature film directorial debut, Wild Boar, is expected to be released in early 2019. For more, please check out b2fx.com. And so it is a truly great honor and a real thrill for me to welcome the extraordinarily talented Barney Berman to StoryBeat. Barney, thank you so much for joining me today. Wow, I sound super impressive when you say it. <laughs> you, you sound like you've been somewhere and done something. Yes, indeed. I know. So, so <laughs> So you got your start very early, I would say earlier than most, working in your father's makeup effects studio when you were just a teenager. Um, were you always, even as a kid, in love with makeup effects? Uh, no, not at all. So how did that work? Just something, something my dad did. That mm-hmm. I had fun more being dressed up as things. You you were a subject so. more than a, than the actual yeah. worker. Yeah, he my, he used to make me up for Halloween or uh, or uh, use me as like, like he had to make some um, some rabbit costumes for a Japanese television commercial and he used <laughs> like one of the little people in there so he used me as his template and then and then uh, used me to make the rats for Food of the Gods <laughs> uh, things like that was it, tests on me for invasion of the body snatchers was it then just the opposite where it was because it was your father's thing in a way as a kid it was like i don't want anything to do with that well it's something in between i just didn't didn't i wasn't drawn to it it was just something that was around that my dad did and i thought it was kind of cool well so I didn't, uh, I didn't dislike it but i wasn't in love with it either uh, i started doing it primarily because i needed a job mm-hmm and you know, it was around. It was kind of in my blood. It was something I could do. 
was there a, a point somewhere in there where you went, wow, this is this is actually more than a job? It's really something I, I mean, I, I assume you like doing it or you wouldn't do so much of it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and once I got in the union, I, I didn't really care about makeup per se as a career. And I uh, hired me to go do the application on a film called Powder. And uh, I got in the union doing that. And once I got in the union, I started to really enjoy it. And I liked being on set, and I liked this whole new group of people I was meeting that were you know, like union professional, on-set makeup artists, and um, and I I really, after a couple of years of that, really thought, you know, I, I really want to be very good at this. It's mm. like if I'm going to do this, I want to be as good as I can be. Right, sure. And and it, it, so there was a point where it kicked in from this is just something to do, as opposed to something this is you really want to do. Correct. Exactly, exactly. And, and as, as I assume that your father was the greatest influence you've had on your work. I assume that's correct, yeah? Uh, you know, I've been lucky enough to have a lot of great influences. Um, Who else? Obviously being, you know, raised around my dad, and I was always a fan of him and his work when I was a kid. Um, and then getting to work for Rick Baker and V. Neal. And, wow. Um, um, you know, just a, a plethora of other really brilliantly talented makeup artists. Uh, whose names you know and some whose names you wouldn't know. Mm -hmm. um, and I, But I learned from all these different people, uh, little tricks here and there. And hopefully I was able to, you know, teach some things to some people here and there as well. Because, because I, 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 I'm certain that, that uh, folks that do what you do, each one has a little different technique or a little different trick or a different approach. And you can learn different things yeah. from each other. I assume. Exactly. Um, when I was uh, when I was about to go into uh, uh, work on the Grinch, and and I had just recently developed sort of my own color theory, which was based on looking at a television set really closely, and realizing that old TVs used to be just like dots, you know, thousands of little or dots, and that's I started thinking in terms of those colored dots. Uh, making a bigger picture, and um, well, I got on working on the Grinch, and I saw other people using an airbrush to spatter and do kind of that same thing. And so uh, that was a big influence on how I, I had to shift about that time. Is it is it the same theory that that Surat and and uh, pixelation is based on? Same kind of thing. Basically, yes. So in other words, you're you're yeah. taking a bunch of little dots and making a, a, a color out of different colored dots. Exactly. I th well, I take uh, you know I, I looked at skin and realized skin is just basically green and red, and with different shades of brown. And then I started thinking in terms of that, and I could pretty much match almost anybody's skin tone if I just thought in those basic terms. Interesting, interesting. Are, are there are there makeup artists from the past who you perhaps never met but admire and study? Uh, well, sure. I, I, I've met Dick Smith, you know, a handful of times, but uh, I, I wasn't, I can't say I knew him well, but, you know, certainly his work was, um, I've been going back to uh, Lon Chaney and, uh, and Jack Pierce and uh, who, who created Frankenstein right. and uh, the Wolfman and uh, the Mummy? Uh, you know, he he created these iconic images that are, are very rarely does someone come up with something that is that impactful uh, and and that simple. It it it's true. Um, the, those folks were enormously influential over what we see on in movies and on TV today. Right. Um, Let alone uh, the guys that did the uh, Wizard of Oz. Well, that was Jack or, Dawn, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, he was in charge of it, but you have a whole team of people, you know, creating there. Um, and uh, you have uh, uh, what's his name that did um, uh, uh, Seven Faces, Doctor Lowe. Uh, you're not 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 uh, one of the Westmores, is it? No, no. Oh, his name's escaping. It'll come to me later. It'll right anyway. in, in the middle of the night. It'll you'll wake up and go. That's the name. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> How many years would you say you really diligently worked at your art before you thought to yourself, "I I'm pretty good at this. I'm I really am okay at this." Uh, you know, I think anybody 
is going to spend 15, 20 years before they master a skill. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think I had a conscious moment when I, when I thought, okay, I'm, I'm now good. Um, cause every time I go into a job, I, I kind of think, I don't know what to do. I, I feel insecure about it. Every time? Pretty much. <clears throat> like, I hope I do. If I don't, then there might be something wrong. I'm a little, I'm a little too settled, a little too, uh, um, you're too, com- <coughs> you're, oh, you're too, too <coughs> complacent. Would be the simple way to say. Exactly, it. exactly. Good word for it. Uh, um, um, you, you know, I, I think I, even I, Steven Spielberg says that when he goes to work every single day, he has what he calls spilkus. Um, yeah. And and I think that that's a a very healthy thing for an artist of any kind to not sit back and rest on your laurels, to always be a little bit. Um, uh, you know, trepidatious of what you're doing. Of course, you're always, in a way, reinventing the wheel, aren't you? Yeah, you're always looking at it from a different angle. How can I make this one better? Or what didn't work about the last one? Or or what is... Uh, that's the thing. It's, it's almost like driving. I find I'm a much better driver when I'm driving with urgency. Um, <clears throat> whether I'm actually going too fast or not is not the issue, but when I, ha- I have a specific need to get somewhere in a timely fashion and there's um, there's a reason for me to get there, uh, I find I'm a better driver. If I'm just driving casually to work, and I, I, my mind is drifting, mm-hmm. and that's not not as good. So when you go in to do a, a job, a creative job, I think it's better to go in with that same kind of sense like, where's the danger? What can happen? And not sort of rest to uh, feel too self-assured about it well so uh, okay so you're uh, you know you do movies and tv filmmaking is a notoriously pressure-packed business how do you handle that pressure when you're under that intensity or do you like it i do like it um i kind of feel alive and excited and um so you welcome it then um i welcome it i'm, I'm excited by by the process and getting to the outcome and I'm excited by how that outcome is going to affect people. Mm-hmm. Although I'll say this, uh, it also a little bit depends on the kind of pressure. I've had producers that have made it a very unpleasant journey. Okay. Um, In what but, way? Um, how have they made it unpleasant? You don't, have um, to, you don't have to name names. I'm just curious about no, no, but, what happens. That's a good question, and I think it comes down to valuing uh, the person they've hired. And I have felt very undervalued and um, by some producers, uh, whether they... I mean, some have just flat out said, we're not going to pay you any more money, and that sucks. Uh, or, or they just don't give you the time, or they don't give you the respect, or, or whatever it is. If you feel undervalued by the people you're working for, that becomes really unpleasant very quickly. Mm-hmm. And, and a lot of it has to do with respect, I would think. And, and, Absolutely. And money, of course. It's number, it's number one. It, it, because uh, you've probably worked with any number of producers or directors or whoever um, who treated you as if you were just, you know, what whatever. Like you weren't important. Well, the, the best experiences are when you feel like you're going in and you're collaborating on something. You're not just a vendor. You're not just... You know, they're not just ordering a pizza. I I have a very hard time picturing what you're delivering to be a pizza. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like people will call up and say, "Hey, we need a, a dead body with a uh, bug that's crawling out of the head. Uh, you got anything like that lying around?" <laughs> and it's like, "No, I don't. I don't I, you know, we don't we don't just have things lying around for you to come in and pick out of our catalog." And there be there are. Places you can do that. If you want to get something cheap and off the shelf, there's probably things you can get. But uh, that's not what I'm interested in. You you don't you don't manufacture um, stuff for the general public. You do each one individually. <clears throat> that's correct. I, I there was a, a sound designer that I believe did Raging Bull, and I think in the um, in the like uh, extras of Raging Bull, you can uh, see this guy talking about how he came up with the sound design and he says that after every job he destroys his tapes hmm. so 
so that he's not reproducing anything on the next job that he did on the previous job. Wow. I thought, my God, that's so brilliant. I wish I had the guts to do that. I would take all my molds and everything I made for one job and just destroy it because I don't want to. I don't want to pull from that old stuff have to you, make something new. Have you ever resorted to that? Has there ever been a case where it was you were in such a hurry you had to resort to that? Well, yeah, and, and like when you're doing a TV series like Grimm, you know they want to bring back creatures, for example. Mm-hmm. So you're going to have to pull out those old molds. Um, and there have been a few times when I've thought, uh, well, helping somebody out, they're doing an indie uh, horror film or a short film or something. And I like to uh, support people's creativity um, when I can. So I say, well, I've got this mold or that mold. I can make piece these two things together and make a new something. But usually it's not... Um, it's sort of artistically all that gratifying for me. You don't get any thrill out of reusing pieces. It's more fun for you to be an artist and keep doing new things. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, all right, so let, let's talk about what happens when you're hired. When you're hired on a production, aside from the obvious, which is that you need to read the script and know what the characters are and so on, um, where does the process of developing a new makeup begin? Where do you start? Is it always the same, or do you come up with a different way to approach every single one? Um, I don't think there is one standard way, but generally I'll try to go on the internet and try to find images of things that, um, that are similar to what we're going to look for. Right. Kind of like if someone's designing a room or a costume or something, start with the feel of something, uh, and then maybe get into some Photoshop work, start coming up with some designs based on what you've kind of agreed is the direction you're going. Mm-hmm. Uh, some, and sometimes it's like more, if it's more medical or something, then, you know, you can, you can pull real images and go, that's the look we want. And that's pretty easy. But if it's more creature related, you have to start getting into developing the details of what that creature is supposed to look like. Do you look for, for drawings from the past, like uh, old uh, drawings from hundreds of years ago where the creatures were around? Do you look for that kind of around, stuff? Uh, yeah, I look, it depends on the creature. I'm, I'm, I look for a lot of old stuff. I like a lot of old art. Absolutely. A lot of, uh, it can be very inspiring. Hieronymus Bosch and that kind of thing? Classic. Yeah, even more. Like, even if you get into, like, a Da Vinci's grotesques or... Uh, That's true. There's a, uh, uh, there's a wonderful artist whose name is me, German artist who used to do these wonderful... Express sculptures of people giving extreme expression, mm. and they're just. I was thinking. Do, I was thinking Daumier, but but he's French. No, it was a German. Uh, Bru- Bru- Bruegel. Possibly, I'd have to look it up. I'm terrible with names. But <laughs> like if I even like uh, working in the shop, I'll say, uh, "Hey, let's." Uh, you know, there's different kinds of chemicals. Everything has numbers. Like 1630 is a urethane that we use. Mm-hmm. But half the time I'm like, just use that gray stuff. <laughs> it, well, it's good that you're an artist and you don't need to worry about names too often. Um, <laughs> so so each new design, I assume, it requires you to approach it uniquely, unless, of course, you're pulling it off the shelf, which you rarely do. Um, do you... Do you uh, you ever work it out on paper, or is it always in a computer first? I like to use a computer. Um, I can draw a little bit, but there. Are, I, I, if I really need to do a paper sketch, something I'll hire someone better than me. Do you I'll do, give a basic idea and then give it to them and say, "Clean this up, make it good." Do you do three like D rendering? Do you do three D CAD? You know, do you make it three D? <laughs> Uh, occasionally I'll, uh, uh, I've done a little bit of ZBrush, but again, there are people are better than me at mm-hmm, it, so mm-hmm. I might hire someone to do a nice ZBrush, uh, you know, 360, uh, rendering of something. Sure. All right. And so now you've got a concept. Do you make a physical test of it somehow? Uh, I, I would love that. <laughs> but you don't get the That's time. rare. Nobody, nobody seems to ever have the time or the money for tests anymore. Mm-hmm. It always tends to be kind of the, the, 
the one you're making is the one they're going to use. So then the first time uh, you do it, are you doing the first time on set? Often, yes. And on Grimm, there was never any time for testing because it was TV. You had to make it and go and put it on, and that's it. That's but um, that's freaking my mind like, out. <laughs> yeah, how? For like Les Grossman, we did we did four or five tests uh, over the course of almost a year um, before we ever got to shooting it. Mm -hmm. That was largely based on Tom's schedule, though. Well, no doubt, and no doubt that was you know you were working with a major superstar. Um, so I just want to go back to this this concept of of you having an idea of what you're doing and then taking it to and putting it on for the first time on set. That how frequently have you done that and had it just be not right? Has that ever happened? Uh, or not? I don't. I don't recall that. Like there are people who say, "Oh, uh, can we change this? Can we tweak that? Mm -hmm. Can we make it a little more this color, something like that." But generally speaking, if you're in that situation, I think everybody's aware. Um, there was uh, only one time when a, a, a director saw something. And it was weird because it was something we made. He saw it. He saw the whole progress, saw the design of it. We got it on set, and uh, he's like, if I see that again, I'm going to kill myself. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you, you never know. It's very hard to predict how someone's going to react. But usually, to my experience, people are pretty satisfied with what I'm delivering, I think. Well, I, you know, I... I, I, I didn't see every episode of Grimm, but I saw enough of them to say to you, um, they all, every creature that you came up with looked, you know, totally realistic for what it was. And it, there wasn't anything Thank that you. I thought, there was nothing that I thought, wow, that's hokey or, or that's lame. I never thought that once. So for you, oh, to, thank you. To, for you to run the table like that, that's, I think that that's a p pretty remarkable thing to do, especially without having done tests. That's the part that's really getting to me is you're, you, you're, I'm figuring you're doing two or three days of testing first, but you're not at all. Um, no, there's just no time. We, had, we would have anywhere between uh, as much as maybe 12 days to get something done mm. or as little as four. Mm. And... Um, and, you know, then we also had to get it done ahead of time because we had to fly it up to Oregon to shoot it. Right. And, um, Would, but, and you, you obviously had to... Transportation took a whole day. I assume you had to have the actors first to do a, a cast of their face. Yes. So, Definitely. So, so, you, so you had to be somewhat in advance of everything. You couldn't do it literally on the set. Um, or, or were you? Were you casting faces on set? Uh, occasionally we did, but usually uh, we would cast the faces in the shop. Um, we would be sort of doing uh, design work. They, they would come to us with a design, and we had some really great designers on it, Constantine Sakaris and uh, Jared Morant, uh, both brilliant um, ZBrush and, and uh, uh, Photoshop designers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they would <clears throat> they were on the show before I was, so they, they would say, here's the idea of the creature, then we would get the actor or the stunt person and have to have to figure out how to meld these together. And I always tried to come up with, find the the reality in it as much as possible. Um, that was just my goal. And they, they liked that. They wanted to keep things as tight and movable and kind of alive as possible. Mm -hmm. And it, it didn't look masky. Well, that's, that's what I, uh, that, that's a great way to say it. It, and, and so thank you for saying that because that was a, that in my head, but I didn't know how to articulate it, is that your your faces in Grimm never looked like they were a, a piece. They always looked like they were an actual character. Um, oh, great. Thank you. A living, that's breathing. That's exactly my goal. Yeah, well, that's, that's phenomenal. It truly is phenomenal. Um, ha has it ever occurred where you've put an actor into something and they can't take being claustrophobic in it? Um, there was only one guy who was a stuntman uh and I'll, I'll go ahead and say his name is kane sinclair okay and the reason i mention his name is because he played more creatures than anybody on that show <laughs> he was at least 24 different creatures oh, wow over the course of the show right. he was so good 
But he would, to self admittedly, he was claustrophobic. And every time we did a makeup on him, he said he'd have one moment where he'd have to kind of hold his breath and just get through it. <laughs> well, I, he's I, a fantastic guy, a great stunt man, and a great creature performer. That's uh, and his name was say it again. Was do you say Claire? Kane Sinclair. Oh, Kane Sinclair. Wow, that's yeah. that's fascinating. And so here's a guy who's making a living out of something that actually terrifies him. Yeah. That's, and I have that's, a, a friend who I used to make up as George Bush, and then Jim Neeb, yeah. and he used to do G- George Bush uh, W M impersonations, and I would make him up, and he'd say, even though he, he came to me and wanted me to do his makeup on him, he says I can't stand sticky things on my face. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have a problem if you're going to be in a creature <laughs> movie. You're going to have sticky <laughs> exactly. things on your face. What do exactly. you don't you know? You just said that, and I didn't even think of it before this moment. What what material do you use to stick stuff on? Is is it spirit gum or something else? What do you use? Uh, spirit gum's a really super outdated uh, uh, old product, uh, but there are um, uh, medical adhesives, uh, different kinds. Calisys uh, is a brand. Uh, Prosade is another brand. Mm-hmm. And. And that has a, a great adhesion that doesn't get doesn't fall off and sweat and all that. Uh, not quickly, you know. If you sweat enough, sure. How much time do you have to spend once you've put somebody in a, for instance, in a mask like in in um, where it's more it's many pieces? I assume in in a show like Grimm. Uh, once you've got them in, how frequently do you have to keep touching them up all the time, or do you let them go for a while? Uh try to put things on pretty well the first time so they don't need a lot of touch up mm-hmm. but you know every now and then something comes up and and you know a, a piece of the mouth starts to flap or something to that effect mm-hmm. you've got to go in and fix it mm-hmm. but uh and then also you want to just kind of keep making things better as you can you, i assume you touch up uh <coughs> makeup coloration or or hair and so on as time goes on Hair is a big one. Hair can definitely get kind of unwieldy. What what do you what type of products do you use for hair? Uh, hair, ha- uh, r- sure. real hair. H- human hair, yak hair, mohair, uh, angora, uh, wool. You know, sometimes uh, someone's totally covered in something. They might be wearing. There's a company in uh, Boston called NFT, National Fiber Technologies. <laughs> okay. And if, if someone's wearing a full hair suit, it probably came from them, hmm. the, the actual material. But it's a, an, an acrylic fiber, uh, mostly. So over the course of your entire career, my assumption is that materials have advanced and changed somewhat, and maybe some more than others. Would that be true? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, there's there's a similarity to it all, and it's just they've gotten better. And and how? I mean, do you go out of your way to stay up to date in new materials and all that sort of thing? All the different materials you use. Uh, there, are, I'm not a fanatic about it. I, I, I like what I like, and I, I get settled on something. Every now and then, I'll introduce something new, or or be introduced to something new, but. There are people who are constantly trying to work out what's the new next best thing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I like to go with mostly what I know and feel comfortable with. Well, that that makes a lot of sense. I also would assume every now and then somebody comes along and shows you something, and you go, "Wow, that's better than what I've been using." And, yeah, absolutely. And off Although you go. Although rarely, to... sometimes people are trying to pitch this new product, and it's like, yeah, it's it's not really improving things any more than what I already use. So. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. And if you're used to it and you like it, why why change? You know, don't, as exactly. As, as they say, if it if it works, don't fix it. You know, so exactly. Um, so obviously, you've worked with a lot of different directors and a lot of very powerful directors, a lot of um, people who have great power in the industry and are very well respected. What is it that, in general, you want or need from a director when you're going in to do whatever? Uh, what is it that you really need from a director? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, <laughs> if, if we have the time, specificity. If we have the time to really get something to really what, get what they envision it being and, and can collaborate on finding the look. If we don't have the time or they don't have the money, then what I want from them is just their trust. 
just trust me. I'm gonna come. I'm gonna bring you something, and you're gonna love it. And uh, but if if you want, if you don't have time or money, and you're gonna be specific about what you want, that's gonna be difficult mm-hmm. because it's hard to please some people. And um, and and but again, if you don't have the time and the money, it's like well, choose. It's like you, you, I, I can give you what you want you got to give me more time and money to do it. Sure. If you, you know, it's like they have, like the triangle, uh, good, fast, and cheap. Right. Pick two. Right, exactly. I can, I can pre- I'm pretty good at giving all three, but if you're going to add in then specificity, um, that's challenging. So the one thing that you didn't emphasize there that I'm, I'm fascinated by is you did not emphasize um, a certain style of way something looks or a, or a tone or whatever that it sounds to me like a lot of people just do trust that you're going to come in with whatever the whatever your vision is uh, that maybe hopefully reflects what little bit they've told you is that true uh, i like to think so i mean i like to think that i i have um some degree of reputation of delivering uh good quality work and that people are going to hire me for that. I think that's you know, not I mean, in doubt. I think that, in fact, at this point, that people come to you because of who you are and what you do, and and that they can trust you to a large extent. Do you ever have a, a you ever deal with directors who just want to meddle in everything? Um, <clears throat> we did a uh, something. Uh, Again, I'm not looking for I names. Don't, no, no, I, I just don't even know if I'm, not, I'm supposed to actually say I was involved in this project. What there if, was a project, a, a video, sure. that was made. It was also turned into an art piece, and we made a bunch of bodies for it. Mm-hmm. And it was one of the hardest things ever because the uh, um, director was literally hanging around my shop every single day. Oh, my goodness. Pointing at things and guiding things and trying to tweak things and talking directly to my artists and I just I would never do that again it was just such an unpleasant experience <laughs> and I think we did some brilliantly uh, lifelike bodies mm-hmm. that, that I'm very proud of well how much ha, have, um, have you done a lot of work in time where somebody just you know it's really good top quality work that's perfect for the thing and somebody just rejects it does that happen uh I don't Think, I don't have. I don't recall having that experience. So, personally. so you're, you're then you're you're awfully good at what you do. Then I mean that's clear. You know, uh, I just wondered if that was ever something that came along. And, and I'm, you're now saying it doesn't. And the closest thing there was there was there was like one or two times on Grimm when I think the uh, the show's creators were not necessarily happy, but. Uh, <laughs> You know, like, because they, they probably imagined something else, and I showed up, and they heard it, and they're like, oh, what, what is that? <laughs> but, it's it's you know, a surprise. <laughs> yeah, but, I mean, again, it's like everything gets worked out, and, and um, it, it, everyone's understanding about the the time in which we're trying to do something, and sometimes maybe there have been a, it was a piece of communication that didn't get through or something, but generally kind of minor stuff. Would, would you say, say the same wants or needs – are true aside from money, which is the obvious one, from producers? Are you looking for the same kind of trust from a producer? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, like, I'm not trying to, I'm not, to, not out to gouge anybody. Uh, I don't, I don't go crazy with charging uh, people outrageous fees. Mm-hmm. I, I, like this, I, as an example, I went around asking my peers some years ago, this is probably at least 10, 15 years ago, what would you charge for a head? Just a cut-off head, no, you know, uh, closed eyes, no hair, um, just the base head. And I got answers, everything from um, like $5,000 to $14,000. Really? Yeah. And, like, I'm not... I don't. I, I was like fourteen thousand dollars. How do you even do that? I mean, how do you stand up and say I'm? What I'm going to do is so good, it's worth that. I, it, but I understand when you start to add up the numbers of the people that you have to hire and the material costs and uh, overhead. 
does all add up rather quickly. And I think producers don't understand why things cost what they cost. Um, and so I'm not out to gouge anybody. I want to be paid, and I want to be able to pay my people and have everybody do their best work and feel valued. But without necessarily, I'm not trying to buy a house off anybody. Um, so I would like the producers to trust that uh, I'm going to give them a fair deal and a brilliant product. Uh, I'm going to try to under promise and over deliver. Mm-hmm. And so they'll, so that they'll be very happy when we get to the set on the day and say, here it is. I want them to, to light up and go, oh my God, that's what, that's what we're paying for. Do you, is, is, uh, do you prefer set work or do you prefer to design and work in your studio? Uh, I like to take it from all the way through. You like all Um, aspects of it. Yeah. And if someone said you can only do one, I would probably pick set work. mm -hmm. But for me, it's really about the whole, um, the whole process and the whole journey of creating something from nothing to uh, all, all the way to fruition. Well, you have the good grace of um, of having it both ways, where you can spend time doing your art sort of isolated in your own cavern, and then you can go out into the world and do something in a, in a unique place. So that that's not, you know, other than in movies, I can't think of too many people that get to do that as an artist. Most of the time people have um, a studio and they stay in their studio. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, I guess so. Uh, it, 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 I'm... I don't think there's a lot of people out there that still come from shop work because I grew up in shop. I do everything that you can do in a shop. Some things I don't like to do. Some things I do more, but I can do it all. And I don't think there's a lot of people who were trained to do all of it in a shop and then can take it to set. And then, uh, cause I also have, uh, done a lot of beauty and straight makeup. And that's really helped me to fine tune, the more extreme things. Um, so it's not <clears throat> just creature wildness. It's, uh, it's specificity again. And, the, and, and if I'm doing a zombie or something, there's a feature about that zombie. That's got to be a, a standout, you know, it's not just here. He's covered in blood and he's rotting. I want to make him a character. Well, in in kind of beautiful uh, in a gory way, and, yeah, and, and 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 zombies are in the specific case of zombies. Zombies are people gone bad. So you're still making people up to look like people in some way. Exactly. Or, yeah, as opposed to the creatures in Grimm, which are fantastic but not human. Um, so th- th- that you're able to, and you say you do a lot of, you've done a lot of straight, uh, just ordinary makeup as well. Mm-hmm. Does that get boring for you to just do straight makeup now after this, this many years of creature stuff? I don't do a lot of straight makeup anymore, uh, but um, I, don't, I never found it boring. Like I did a show called Brimstone, yeah, and I used to make up Lori Petty on the show, right? Uh, and also like John Glover, and I, I loved interacting with both of them. They're terrific actors, great people. And Lori Petty went out one night afterward. I, I made her up. Uh, for the show and then at the end of the day I touched her up and she went out with her friends and she came in the next day and she said I just want to thank you my friends told me I've never looked so good <laughs> and that that kind of thing just makes me glow you know if I could if I can affect somebody in any way that just makes their day better make them brighter and it makes me really happy mm-hmm. well that's that's cool so I, I'm curious what is it from your perspective what is it that's the most um most attractive thing to you about being on set? What do you love about being on set? What is great about it? Uh, that's a good question. And I'm not sure, other than I feel at home. I feel like um, uh, it, it, we're all there to serve this product and this project. And, and even the, whether you're the director or producer, you're a um, uh, to grip or your makeup artist, whatever you are, we're all there to serve the project. Mm -hmm. And uh, I like that sense of collaboration, everybody coming together and creating something. It's kind of like an extended version of playing dress up. That's why I don't like green screen 
watch movies too much because I don't want to work on them. I don't want to be, I want to go into a world that, whether it's based on reality or it's uh, fantasy, I want to go and live in this other world and experience it Mm -hmm. and see the story unfold. And that excites me. So what would you say, what would you say is the single biggest challenge you've ever had, whether in the, in the studio or on set, uh, what's the biggest challenge you've ever had that you can think of, of, and how did you solve it? What did you do? Um, well, when you say that, the first thing that comes to my mind is, and it was like in season two of Grimm, they wanted us to make a um, um, a lava man. Lava that, man. And, and that would literally glow from the inside. I thought it would be a CG thing for sure, and they said, no, nope, we want you to do it. <laughs> And we had, uh, literally, we put this lava man together that uh, Derek Mears played. Not so Derek Mears, uh, uh, Brian Steele played this lava man. And um, we put him together in 12 days. <laughs> and we literally had to make a glowing L-wire suit that went underneath a transparent silicone suit. Wow. So that he could be lit from the inside. We had little LEDs inside his mouth, and then we had the uh, glowing... Um, with glow, you know, glowing mouth and eyes, and it's just really, really proud of how that all came together. And uh, but it was quite a challenge. It was a backbreaker. How, how, how? What did you do? Did you put dental appliances in? How did you put it in the mouth? Yeah, we had these uh, dent- these teeth uh, that had a little uh, like acrylic teeth, and in the roof of the mouth there was a little indent in the false teeth for a battery and the LEDs and. It was fun. But then also uh, one of the most difficult things was uh, this uh, Sasha Baron Cohen. uh, Oh, yes. We had to make people, make him look real to the eye in bright light uh, two feet away from somebody. How do you do that? uh, (laughs) But uh, I just want to say, Tony Tony Gardner brought me on. It was his job, and he brought me on to do application. Um, And uh, he and I, there were some other artists involved, but he and I primarily went around the country uh, making them up, and it was just about taking our time and fine-tuning um, kind of like to a, to a crazy degree. It was also because we had to change it. It wasn't like, like if something, if he got recognized, we'd say, okay, uh, that one didn't work. Let's change the forehead and put this different forehead on next time, or we change the eyebrows. Or, so it was always this evolution to it that... Um, so you couldn't design it all and that set and learn how to put that puzzle together and just put that puzzle together over and over. You had to put that puzzle together better each time. Did, did, did people ever see through? Did they get it? There was a few times, um, but it was rare. I was, I was surprised, happily surprised at how rare. There was one girl who walked into the room and instantly turned around and said, nope, this is not real. This, something's weird. This is off. This doesn't feel right to me. It seems like a guy in makeup to me. And it was, I, I, it's like she barely looked at him and just turned around and felt bad about it. And but and then she's like, I, I, I'm just I'm intuitive. I'm a little bit psychic in the way, and, mm-hmm. and, I, and I just don't feel right about this. And the funny thing is, everybody's going, Ah, oh, she's just crazy. I'm thinking she's the only sane one here. <laughs> yeah, she she picked up a, you, you know, and for, for my money, I've never seen a. You can say whatever you want. I've never seen a man do that, but I've seen many women do things like that. Women have a, yeah. a sixth sense for that kind of stuff. And, yeah. And I, I'm fascinated by that, too. But they, you know, my, my ex-wife, um, she she knew things in advance and was like, how do you know? But but she always knew. Yeah. Um, it, so was was he, you're saying you fine-tuned, was uh, Sasha very cooperative? Was he really into it? Absolutely, he was fantastic. He would say, you know, it, you, if you see something, you got to get it. You got to get it now. You got to fix it now because you can't do it then. You can't do it while he's talking to people. Right, sure. And you're so not, and say, you're not on a set, are you? I mean, they made it. Obviously, they were making a quote unquote documentary or TV show or whatever they were pulling off that that gag. But no, we're in hotel rooms, right? And, and uh, classrooms, and you know, uh, backstage at some kind of weird, you know, downtown. Um, um, concert hall or, or all kinds of weird. Where, where would you put your trailer? Where would you work? 
there no no trailer we would just bring our little bag we'd make them up in a hotel room and then bring our bag with us and uh that's it wow we i, I was literally i would literally <laughs> i was trapped in a men's room one at one point and i had the uh fold out table for um you know baby changing yeah that was my makeup station <laughs> <laughs> and i was just stuck in there for about six hours <laughs> And and I I'm guessing he was um, truly into it because the more detailed you got, the better it was for him. Yeah, I mean, truly, truly an impressive guy. I was uh, he, he put up with a lot. He tolerated a lot. He was always appreciative, and um, and he did an amazing job. When I saw the, the show come together, I was like, holy crap! That's so much better than I even thought it was going to be. Oh, it's it's very impressive. It really is impressive. It's frightening how. Uh, how quickly and easily he fools a lot of people. It, it, it's, exactly. it's very impressive. Well, you know, he can't do Borat anymore. Everybody knows that. So he has to move on to other things. Um, have, yeah. And you don't, again, don't need to name names. This show's not about exposing those kinds of things. Uh, but are, have you worked with actors who were very uncooperative, big stars or anything like that? They're just And how do you deal with that? You know, oddly enough, I, I have had really good fortune even people who have said oh so and so's a problem i worked with them and had a really good experience the few people i've had bad experiences with were not big stars Interesting. they were people who wished they were who mm-hmm. thought they were in mm-hmm. their heads there were uh, like some stunt men very very few most stunt men are fantastic but there's one or two that were just like egomaniacal nut jobs and very disrespectful oh. um but again, very few and far between. Fortunately, I feel actually kind of really uh, grateful that I haven't had too much of that uh, so thrust upon me. You are fortunate because you know there the uh, Hollywood is replete with stories of of um, narcissists and all the rest of it. Um, but, but okay, so in but I am curious for the listeners when you ran into a, uh, someone like that who was uncooperative or. Um, you know, egomaniacal or whatever. Do you have a technique for handling them? Do you treat them differently? Do you do anything, or do you just let them go? Uh, I like to knee them in the balls. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. I, Remember I, that, uh, everybody. Knee them you know, in the balls. <laughs> that's right. Just do that. Here's the thing, and, and again, I go back to: we're there to serve a, a purpose. We're there to serve a project, and. It took me a long time to learn it, but my um, job for an actor is to be of service to them as much as possible. Mm -hmm. What's going to make them more comfortable so that they can do their job? And when I approach it in that respect, um, I generally don't have a problem with anybody. Uh, If someone does still give me attitude... um, it's hard to muster up because I'm I'm a guy who who can be a little righteous a little quickly uh, and believe I know better, and I have to swallow it and just say, Dip, let them have it. It's not time. This is not the battle that I want to fight. Mm-hmm. So I I step back. If someone gives me attitude, I step back. I give them their space. Mm-hmm. And, um, and you know, uh, as a hairdresser who, who was going through a lot of challenging uh, moments trying to get a uh, hairstyle right on this actress and uh and i was watching her just the the producers and director everybody's like what if we do this what if we do that what if we do pigtails what if we do a ponytail what about blah blah blah." and i uh, her name was aura green that uh, hairstylist she's a brilliant older woman and i said aura how did you put up with that and she said you know i just told myself a long time ago this too shall pass well, and as you say, you've been very fortunate that you don't bump into it too often. Uh, but yes, this too shall pass is a great attitude to take because you know better than anybody, as many sets as you've been on, you're going to deal with all kinds of people and all kinds of attitudes and, yeah. and takes on things. Yeah. And it's usually not really personal. Like, you know, uh, very seldom do they, like only once or twice, I think, that someone actually took a personal jab at me and I thought, all right. Back off, let you, you know, you can be the asshole. If I can say asshole. Um, you, you can, you can. <laughs> okay. 
uh, I'll, I'll just I'll, I'll collect my paycheck at the end of the day and I'll thank you on the way out uh, but um, but I'm, I don't have I don't find getting into it and creating conflict where it's not necessary has ever been beneficial on a set it's usually probably not beneficial in life but uh, you know I'm not, I'm not so good at it in other, in other areas but in on the job um, I try to just uh, let it roll off my back as much as I can. Mm-hmm. So for, later on, I'll, I'll come home and bitch about it to my wife. <laughs> well, I hope not too much. <laughs> uh, no, no, no. Uh, for for the listeners, pay attention to what Barney just said because the truth is, uh, if you look at his resume and how many dozens of projects he's worked on, that is because he has that attitude. And, and, of course, his talent. But people, even with great talent, people with great talent in Hollywood, if they're really jerks, unless they're bringing in a lot of money to other people, they don't last very long. Because who wants to work with them? Yeah, it's true. If you, if you come in with attitude and uh, or you snap back at people or you, you're you going to be like, this isn't right. If you're going to be righteous about injustice, uh, just, you know, you're going to run into it and people are going to... Uh, conflict with you and then that's not going to ultimately look good on you mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, what what uh, and i believe me I've, I've been through that too so I, i'm sure you have i'm sure you've been through all the, all the various mills uh what would you say is your do you have a, f- a favorite makeup that you've done is there one that's like the the, the one in your brain you like know, that was it usually when someone asks me that my, my answer is this one this one Whatever this, whatever this one is, it's usually the thing that I'm into or it's where my focus is, mm-hmm. and I, it's where my enjoyment is. Um, you know, if I'm pressed, there are certain makeups of the long face alien in the bar in Star Trek. Mm-hmm. Uh, my good friend Doug Tate played him, and I, I'm really proud of that guy. Um, the, 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 the Tom Cruise, uh, Les, Les Grossman. Grossman makeup, I'm proud of all the stuff work you, I got to you, do you should be with Tony Gardner you should be very proud of Les Grossman because Les Grossman it really didn't look like Tom Cruise and yet Tom Cruise was right there as well so I am I am proud of that and, and uh you know what I actually one of my proud most I was at a party the following year a Halloween party and someone walked in as Les oh. Grossman. <laughs> all right Someone's making. Someone's doing a, a Halloween costume out of one of uh, my characters. Have you created any proprietary makeup that that uh, that you own the rights to? No, no, I'm not really. You know, I I tried selling some makeup bags some years ago mm-hmm. and, and uh, creating new designs for makeup bags. And after about a year of that, I thought I don't want to be a bag salesman, and I don't want to create product like that and be a factory or a salesman that's not where my skills lie no you, you know the the, pr- the problem with that barney is that then you have a maintenance issue you're constantly maintaining this pro- yeah. this product as opposed to moving on to your fresh new thing all the time and i'm way too add for that okay well that's good <laughs> which i used to call a creative add but i think it's really just add but i, to, <laughs> I want to jump around from one thing to another which is why uh, as a segue, I went into you know directing because I, I want to keep doing different things and not just be stuck doing a particular thing. Well, that was my next set of questions for you. We want, want to talk about Wild Boar. And you both wrote it and directed it, correct? And produced it. That's correct. And Okay, so I, I'm, I truly can't wait to see it. It's coming out in 2019. Um, and I, I have seen photographs of you on set with the makeup and all the rest of it. It looks just fascinating. What was, where did this come from? Where did this idea come from? Uh, well, a friend of mine, a guy named Andy Jones, he and I were talking about doing some, uh, a film together. We we're going to do a werewolf movie together. And we wrote it. I wrote it actually, and he was going to direct it and, um, it didn't end up happening. And um, then he went off to do some other movie, like a ghost movie. And he came to me and he said, I've been thinking about this idea for a film uh, that was sort of uh, the Planet of the Apes with pigs. Okay. And that stuck with me. And um, I wrote a script and he was going to direct it. And the script was, we realized it was too big, it was undoable on a, on a kind of no 
budget thing. And um, so, I don't know, then we, we went away from the project again, and it just kept sticking with me. And, um, like, end of 2014, beginning 2015, I, I just kept sticking with me. I kept saying, i got to write this. So, I, But I, I went to Andy and I said, if I'm going to write this, though, I want to direct it. And he agreed. And uh, that's the how it came, started out. And then we did a, a uh, uh, Indiegogo campaign to try and raise money right. to do it. And I raised just enough money to pay for the Indiegogo campaign. <laughs> um, so where'd you get your money? Yeah. How did you raise it? Uh, I sold a house. I, I had a house and I had a crazy uh, Russian florist who was also a hoarder. And he, he was living in my house. Uh, he was renting it out. And, um, and then he stopped paying rent and I had to evict him. And it was, it was like a long, uh, arduous process to try and get him out of my house and then sue him for the money <laughs> that I'll never see. Um, but what he did is he, he left behind, he was a hoarder, he left behind huge amounts of just garbage. And um, that's exactly what I needed for my set design. <laughs> so I collected all that stuff from the house. I took over to my shop. <laughs> I built, we built sets in the back of my studio, and we used this crazy hoarder um you know uh collection of stuff as our set you 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 probably don't know this but many years ago i directed and co-produced a no budget movie called lucky that won a lot of awards and it was right. a, it was about a uh, down and out alcoholic cartoon writer, and all he had in his house were beer cans and garbage. So we did the same thing. We collected all this stuff, and he would walk through his house in a sea of beer cans. Nice. <laughs> so I understand where you were coming from. Okay, so now you you have a location. Did you shoot the whole thing in the one place? We shot a few days, I think like five days or something, well, maybe three days at first in. Um, my studio on one set that we built back there mm -hmm. and then we went out to the Salton Sea in the desert for uh, eight or nine days and shot there and then we came back we tore down the set that we had in my studio and we built another set and we shot uh, like four days um, again in my studio in this new set and we just kept doing that and uh Altogether, it was about 23 days of shooting, but it was spread out over about a year and a half. Do you have a, do you have a star in it? I do. I have a, a extremely uh, talented actress named Augie Duke, who um, is on the rise, and she's so talented, uh, such a ball of energy. Uh, and I have uh, uh, Daniel Roebuck, mm -hmm. who's been a friend of mine for years. And, uh, you know, he was in um, um, the, uh, oh, the one guy that got the one arm with Harrison Ford. And he was on Matlock and uh, uh, just uh, his, 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 the River's Edge. And his body of work is just huge. It's like, you know, a very, very long IMDb list. He's a very a well-known actor. Yeah, the Fugitive is correct. Uh, it, it, and did you also do the makeup yourself, or did you have people doing it for you while you were directing? I designed uh, the makeups, the, the creatures, but then I handed them over to uh, my <coughs> my lead uh, makeup artist, uh, who was a guy named Nick Reisinger. He was in my shop. Uh, he was, used to run my shop during Grimm. Um, on Wild Boar, he was a production designer, uh, prop master, makeup effects uh Actually, sort of the makeup overlord of everything. So I handed off the actual uh, applications um, to him and, and a small, like two or three other people he had on his team. And do, do, did you did you love directing? Was it great for you? Ah, I loved it. I loved it. If I'd known I was going to love it as much, I would have started 30 years ago. Are you going to do more? I am going to do more, actually. I have a film uh, that uh, a dear old friend of mine... Um, a woman named Susan Basso has written a very dark uh, <laughs> film about a serial killer, more of a character study piece than, than your average serial killer movie. Mm -hmm. um, 
and it's called The Murdering Kind. And, uh, That's a good title. We're putting that together to, to shoot early next year. And, and, and uh, you're raising financing now, then? We are. Yeah. And, and we is have that, a little bit, and we're looking for more. Is that also makeup heavy, or is it less makeup heavy? I, I, it's, there's some in it, uh, and there's some some pretty horrific things happen. Um, but it's like I say, it's more of a character study, um, which I like because when we get to those payoff moments, they're going to be that much more impactful. Mm-hmm. We're not wasting it. None of it is is gratuitous. You feel like you're pretty good at working with the actors? You know, I when I didn't want to be a makeup artist, I wanted to be an actor. And I studied uh, from a young age, from like 14 also, I was starting to study acting. Um, and I studied with a man named Sanford Meisner, who was one of the premier acting teachers in the 20th century. Indeed. And... Uh, I was fortunate enough to study with him for a few years. There's a there's the a techni- there's a technique named for him. <laughs> Absolutely, the Meisner technique. Yes. And I I studied a lot of different places, and I never kind of knew why I would be good when I was good or why I was bad when I was bad. And then after about a month in Meisner's class, I was like, oh, ah, I get it. <laughs> I gotta listen to. <laughs> I gotta be ready to react. <laughs> you know, but it. It just became all very clear to me, and and um, so I still, every now and then, I'll act in something. I act in my own movie, and I act in, in friends' movies here and there. Okay, so but acting and directing are related, but two different things. Do you? I, I teach a course at Point Park University where we're recording this, uh, in that I created called "Acting and Directing for Writers," and so nice. the, the the question that I have is: you feel like you're good at getting actors to to give you a performance that you're you're hoping to get? Yes, I feel that um, I kind of understand actors, and it, even all actors, even the actors who have the same technique, have different takes on that technique. Mm-hmm. And I, I want to talk to them and figure out what they're going to like and how they're going to work. And um, I remember there's a article I read a long time ago on uh, uh, Butch Cast and the Sundance Kid. Right. And Paul Newman is somebody who just eats up information and wants to talk about things in depth and figure out what's the character and who is he and where's he from and why is he doing this and Whereas Robert Redford's like, all right, don't talk to me. Just leave me alone. If you if you have a direction, give it to me in as little you know, vocabulary as you can. <laughs> Just leave me alone. And I think, okay, so the two great actors, and I want, again, it's almost like a makeup artist. My job is to serve the project, and my serving the project is to make them feel as comfortable as they need to be to do their best job. So I'll take that same approach as a director as well. There's a famous story about Alfred Hitchcock directing Paul Newman and Paul Newman desperately wanting to know what his motivation was for a scene and Hitchcock turning to him. This could be an apocryphal story, but but nevertheless, the, the, the story always goes that Hitchcock turned to, to Newman and said, it's the it's the hundred thousand dollars that we're paying you. <laughs> <laughs> I heard another great Hitchcock story is uh uh, who was it when was it in the birds or in vertigo or something? The actress was going up into the bell tower. I think it was vertigo. Vertigo. That's yeah, Kim, Kim Novak. Said, why? Yeah. Kim Novak said, why am I going to the bell tower? And he says, because I want you to. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is exactly right. And if it's Alfred yeah. Hitchcock, you better go into the bell tower. And I'll admit I used that a couple of times in my movie. It's like, well, why is he doing this? Why am I doing this? Like, because I want. <laughs> <laughs> well, Barney, we've been... That's uh, going to lead into something else. <laughs> We, we've been talking for over an hour, and we are coming no toward, toward the end of the show. And this has just been a, just a wonderful, uh, great batch of information and, and tremendous um, stories. I'm wondering if you, um, in all of your experiences, if you have uh, any kind of a story that you could share with us that's offbeat, quirky, weird, funny, oddball, something like that. You know, I, <laughs> I have a lot. I bet you do. 
actually. And um, I was even considering at one time when I, I thought, when I get older, I'm going to make a story, or a book about called Bernie's List of Celebrity Snubbings. <laughs> <laughs> it was just like all the times when I felt a little bit like uh, slighted by somebody <laughs> who either was a celebrity or thought they're a celebrity, just my boss, whatever. And so I, I had this whole like um, uh, sort of like freezer full of little fast food trays of anecdotal uh, moments when I, I felt jaded in some way. Yeah. Um, and I, I wouldn't like I couldn't even pick one. Um, off the top of my head, too, that was more impactful than the others. Um, so I would say there's, there's a whole bunch, whole, a whole salad of potential <laughs> stories there. But I realized that uh, some time ago that, that it doesn't serve me. It doesn't serve me to have that uh, sort of freezer full of um, hurt feelings, if you will. Right. Do, so that, but, but is there pretty is, much my answer to that? Is 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 there one funny story that you have from your career? Um, I don't know. So I'll, I'll, I don't know how funny it is, but I just what came into my mind just now is uh, we did uh, Mission Impossible Three and Philip Seymour Hoffman. We did his head cast, and he at the end of it, he we pulled the head cast off of him and he came up out of the room and he goes that was like torture <laughs> <laughs> but i think he probably used it for the film because he was uh, you know a, uh, playing a guy who gets tortured or has experienced torture or doles out torture oh yeah i think he was just into that mindset <laughs> and so and finally do you have um a solid piece of advice or a tip for those trying to make it into the business or those trying to become, you know, more deeply involved in the business to help them on their, on their path. Uh, yeah. Don't compile a list of celebrity snubbings. <laughs> it all ties in. But, yeah, exactly. I mean, there was, a, if you're, if that's where your focus is going to be, then that's what you're going to get. If your focus is going to be on, the hurt or the the injustice or the negativity uh, that you experience, and you'll experience some, people as you will in life. Uh, but if that's what your focus is on, then that's what you're going to get paid in a way. Um, but if your focus is on the fun, the excitement, the wonder, uh, the creativity, the journey. Um, then that's going to be, you're going to find a much happier you, I think. You're, you're saying to be uh, positive and do all the various things you've already taught us within this show uh, to have a good attitude toward what your work is. Exactly. Well, that, enjoy I, the ride. Enjoy the ride. Rather, I th I think rather than sitting on a roller coaster saying, I hate this thing, i got to get off. Enjoy the ups and the downs and the turns and just know that it's all an evolution. Even if the, in, the, in the hard times, that's going to pass and it'll be over and you'll get on to something else. Um, so you might as well try to have fun with it as much as possible. That is a very interesting thing you just said because on my computer at home where I work, there is a phrase that I put up on top of the computer and it says, all it says is enjoy the ride on this roller coaster. That's all nice. it says. So. So you, you hit it right on the head for me. <laughs> well, hey, that's all I want to do is hit you on the head. Thank you. <laughs> and, and I know you can make it look like I'm bloody on top of it. <laughs> Barney, this has been a great treat, and I am so grateful for you coming on the show today and spending some time. Oh, thank you, Steve. I really appreciate you asking me to do this. I had a lot of fun. Well, great. Right. Well, and thank you very much. Thank you. And so we've come to the end of today's Story Beat. If you like this podcast, please take a moment to give us a comment, rating, or review on whatever app or platform you're listening to. Your support helps us bring more great episodes to you. This podcast would not have been possible without the generous support 
of the Center for Media Innovation on the campus of Point Park University. Until next time, I'm Steve Cuden, and may all your stories be unforgettable.